You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music can mean, quite literally, only one thing. It is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, the show where we break down the week that was, and indeed still is, on the futures options side of the fence. So we'll talk some equities, maybe we'll talk some ags, talk some energy, rates, whatever the heck is dominating our tapes out there this week. Of course, you guys, as always, can play along with the home game. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. That's the place to go to play along and kick the tires and light the fires, if you will, and see what's cooking out there. You guys have been asking us, we've been asking ourselves, actually, <laughs> What the heck is going on with these crazy new the options we've been waiting for for so long on the Bitcoin futures? So, yeah, we're going to have crypto back on the show this week. Listeners are going to have special guest from CME, old friend Tim McCourt, going to put his feet to the fire in the CME hot seat, talk about why they're launching options now, all that good stuff. Stay tuned for that in a little bit. But first, I do believe I am joined now by my cohort. My compatriot, my partner in crime, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell, Mr. Sean Smith. Mr. Smith, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. We had him, listeners, and I think we lost him. All right, let me try that again, listeners. While we get on rolling with what the heck is actually lighting it up out here this week, there's quite a bit, actually. Let's get into it. First, let's do our movers and shakers. Let's start off. Let's, let's be positive. Let's look to the upside, because it's kind of a bit of a weird one here this week. A number five on our top five here. Again, these are what's moving and shaking in the underlying here on CME Group. Let's start number five on the top five. Eurodollar up 
about two and a quarter percent this week. Number four, live cattle. Actually, there's a bit of a bit of a theme here this week with some some livestock dominating the top five. And number four, live cattle, two point three percent. Number three, feeder cattle, up three point one percent. Then our old friend Lean Hogs, aka Hog Love, up three point one three percent. And then we're seeing some uh, some funky Brent up a little north of four percent out there, which is kind of interesting. All right, let's see if let's see if Mr. Sean has mitigated his technology woes. Mr. Sean, can you hear me now, sir? I can hear you. Ah, um, there he I'm is. I'm going to keep myself on mute when I'm not talking because I am outside and I'm in a uh, heavily trafficked place here in New York City. <laughs> As I would expect from you, nonetheless. Well, Mr. Sean, you've been traveling. A lot of late, hither and yon. So maybe let's start there. Catch us up. I know you just came back from the Risk Management Conference, which is a big conference in the equity volatility space. Uh, any interesting nuggets from that, and maybe any interesting takeaways? And our audience is always asking us about, you know, buy rights on the S- um, on the Rus- S and P, but also on the Russell two thousand. So there's a lot of studies they love, and it usually comes out of an event like that. Any interesting takeaways over there from that event, sir? Absolutely. The, the CIBO, uh, CIBO Global puts on a risk management conference, and they do it globally, and it's a tremendous event um, of which they get uh, a good representation of uh, most of the trading ecosystem to attend. And this year it was based in Munich, Germany, which is just an absolutely wonderful place. The, the conference was two weeks prior to uh, the beginning of Oktoberfest, which I think was a good thing so that people stayed at the event rather than go off and drink out of big steins of beer in German beer halls. But uh, I have to tell you, the the content was incredible. The discussion about volatility was fantastic. And and specifically speaking, there was a a fantastic panel that uh, was uh, with... The focus was Russell 2000. Uh, Rolf Agather, who I think has been on the show before, gave a a really good presentation on the index and its performance, uh, the history of the index, its its components, the makeup, the the reconstitution, just to really get the awareness of uh, the small cap index into the eyes and the minds of uh, the European clients that attended the conference. And following Rob's presentation, um, I had um, a gentleman from Newberger Berman uh, give a tremendous presentation on his fund and how he uh, participates in uh, uh, trading Russell 2000 options as a uh, as a volatility harvesting opportunity. It uh, was uh, fantastic. That gentleman who uh, uh, comes from Newberger Berman is the head of equity derivatives at Newberger Berman. His name's Doug Kramer, and he just did a a fantastic job of of giving the audience the opportunity to just hear the benefits of uh, trading Russell 2000 options and particularly his experience doing it, which I think went over extremely well. There was lots of questions, lots of discussion, and uh, it, it was uh, fantastic. So I think overall, Sebo does a phenomenal job of, of creating a venue of relevant, timely, just value embedded content and it, it just went off without a hitch and the compliments just were flying post conference. It, it, it was it was fantastic. It was well worth anybody's time who was there, which is the case with most of SIBO's risk management conferences. This this one was over the top though. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It doesn't surprise me to hear that there'd be some interest in in premium harvesting. I haven't been to the European one, but I've been to most of the domestic ones and that certainly does seem to be a, a theme. I often joke at that conference. It seems like everyone collectively has awakened to the joy of selling puts, which they often colloquially term as, as harvesting the risk premium to make it sound a little bit less intimidating uh, to that audience. But speaking of the audience, you know, you brought up an interesting point, and I'm kind of curious because we certainly have been hearing from our audience lately, Sean, since you've been on the TWIFO program. A lot of them have been writing in. You know, with more questions as you'd expect about Russell and Russell 2000 and what's going on out there with that index and, and trying to parse its movements versus the big market, big market cap ones like the S&P and the NASDAQ. We obviously break it all down here from a volatility perspective, which we'll do in a little bit. So that helps a little bit. But it's still they are they're you know, they're looking to wrap their heads around this this index and what it means 
uh, on its own. What's it like when you're talking to a European audience who may not even be familiar with the Russell 2000? What, what's their response when you approach these European money managers or asset managers and say, hey, what do you think about U.S. small cap stocks? How does that conversation go? It actually goes off rather well. Um, uh, diversification of a portfolio is very, very important. And to have Russell 2000 have that small cap uh, index uh, represented uh, for one, for its ability to, to outperform at points, but also because of its, its, its unique volatility, it becomes a, 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 an opportunity for for those that are that are trading derivatives to take advantage of, and, and if you're investing in the Russell 2000, um, there's the opportunity to hedge that portfolio or to harvest. You know, I, I hate to use the word harvest while I'm studying. It's become a colloquial term in our in our industry, but um, uh, there, there, you know, there were we had both sides of the trade at, at this conference where buying that downside protection is sometimes more expensive because of its volatility value, but you got the other side of that transaction who who benefits from that. And um, I, you, you know that phrase I've used several times on the show, by puts when you can, not when you have to. Um, those those two parties met at this conference in a, in a big way, and it's just a, a, a really healthy conversation. So um, in terms of European awareness, the fact that the Russell 2000 is, you know, a, a domestic U.S. tariff war kind of insulated um, index, a lot of people paid attention. Um, I have to say, and I'm, I, 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 I could be uh, speaking out of step, but first day of the conference, as Russell 2000 was mentioned, I think uh, rep, rep volume on SIBO was the highest it was in for this year on that day. So call it a coincidence, but uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the fact that you see on the CNE side such a global representation in, in the market uh, sector segments that are trading, uh, see me Russell futures. I'm telling you this, this product is global um, based on that. And based on the fact that there, there's such a, an interest from the European uh, market to, to learn more about Russell 2000. Well, I'm glad to hear it before I move on to what's breaking things up and what's moving from a vol perspective out here in the indices and talk about any interesting paper we see out here in the equity options. I'm, I'm just curious because I know, I know our audience. I know their wheels are already turning. Maybe they're already typing as we speak with the questions because we've gotten a lot of them before about when we touched on in the past some studies about doing buy rights and things in the Russell 2000 and their efficacy versus just being along the underlying. You kind of teased us there with a little bit of a, of a session a panel on some premium harvesting strategies that were pretty interesting in the Russell 2000. I'm just going to head off the email now, Sean. You got any nuggets, any, any takeaways from that session? What, what exactly were they doing? Was it just all the money puts? Was it more involved? Before we get deluged with emails, sir. Um, it was across the board. It was uh, buy rights and put rights, both. Uh, you know, um, there was discussion of risk reversals as, as trading strategies, but uh, um, I would say verticals were the, the probably the, the most common theme and on the put side because of the skew um, in, in, the, in the rough box. Interesting. You know, it has been more active from a skew perspective than, than a lot of uh, the other names out here. Let's look at the action out here from a vol perspective. And, you know, it's a weird week on the equity space. You know, last week it seems like we were marching back up to new highs. Of course, this week we have, I guess, what can be loosely termed impeachment premium getting baked into the market. Most of the major equity indices selling off again. Not a ton, but enough to, to lift things up. And the vol getting a little bit firmer this week. We're seeing VIX cash. It was hovering at about almost a 17 handle coming into our premium previous show. Then it sold off about a 16 half. Now it's sold off yet again, down to about 1620. That puts it up about a little over a handle, about a handle and a quarter from where it was last week. The volatility of volatility, aka the VIX, is still right around that 100 level. So that triple digit level, that's where you really got to start paying attention to. That means things are elevated, things are frothy, and Go figure. The vol is moving, so it, it seems to be merited. And our old friend RVX also feeling a little bit of the lift up to about a 21. That puts it up about over two handles, about 2.3 points from this time last week. And that spread 
had widened out substantially. In fact, remember we had Russell Rhodes on a week or so ago, maybe two. I, I, I lose track. There's so many shows. Uh, but uh, he was on. It was, it was threatening a six-handle then, that spread. And I was kind of surprised, maybe a little over five, about five and a half. And he thought he still needed to be a little bit wider before it really enticed him because of the fact that there really is no ball product on the Russell side to make that trade easier. So to entice him to do it, and you got to get through the actual underlying options themselves, he wanted a little bit wider to be attractive. He thought somewhere around a six. Well, that spread tightening up now, getting down to a little bit north of four, about 4.15. So quite a bit tighter than last week, about a handle and a quarter, handle and a half, uh, somewhere in that range. We're talking... Vol products, Sean. We don't get you on that often. You're traveling so much, so I want to hit you before you, before you got to jump off again really quickly. In fact, I was talking with Russell Rhodes on the show last week, talking with Russell about Russell. Go figure. And we were talking about kind of the, the lack of the commensurate Vol product on the Russell 2000, something that you and I have talked about a lot. Obviously, our old friend RVX, hopefully will it ever see the light of day again. Was that ever brought up in the European circle? Were the Europeans aware of RVX? Is there any latent interest in bringing back some Russell Vol in Europe? There, there was plenty of discussion because RVX was actually discussed on a panel, uh, and, and my panel specifically. Um, um, Doug brought it up uh, several times, uh, bringing up uh, bringing up the uh, uh, RVX VIX spread. He, he brought it up in his conversation as an example of the opportunity. He also brought up the, the point that you can't trade RVX futures today, but you have you have that ability to still harvest that bob instead of using the options as we have, have discussed. That being said, um, Cebo would love to relaunch RVX at some point when it makes sense and they have uh, uh, robust liquidity in the product. And uh, th- that day's coming. I'm 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 very optimistic about it. I I work with. Uh, uh, SIBO on this, um, I can't, no date, no promise. Uh, you know, that's, that's SIBO's business. That's their, their contract. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic at some point in time in the future we're going to be seeing a, 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 a rebirth of RVX in a, in a future form of some kind, hopefully. Well, that's awesome. You know, you and I have talked about it a lot. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard you this optimistic yet. So hopefully all my bugging you on this on this subject, Sean, hopefully hopefully has led to good things and not just frustration for you, sir. <laughs> I, I've always said I've always said it's all about client demand. So just just remember Richard Rosenthal at Cebo dot com. Get get uh, get all of you uh, customers that want this future back. Uh, reach out to Rick Rick Rosenthal at at Cebo because uh, client demand is. Is a, po- is a powerful voice. Well, Sean, I know you have to get rolling, so I'll let you get out of here in a bit. I will let you know we do have coming up your buddy there, Mr. Tim McCourt from CME. We're going to dive a lot into the crypto, but you'll be pleased to know that I did give him a bit of a, a bit of a hard time to talk some Russell too, just for your sake, sir. So there you go. I, I got your jabs I, I, in for you. If, I know. I know Tim's going to do it. He's a tremendous partner. CME Group is like uh, head and shoulders, uh, phenomenal partner and. They're at literally knocking the cover off the ball with uh, with Russell Futures, Russell Options, and now the Micros. So, yeah, get Tim to talk about it because he's excited about this as I am. Um, and Tim's a great partner. And make sure you tell him I said hello, please. I did, not he did lament the fact he was in town, but we couldn't make the uh, – in fact, that's why I actually had to beam him in remotely earlier than this show because we just couldn't make the schedules line up to come in exactly during showtime. So I'm going to toss to that conversation in a little bit. But he did lament the fact, Sean, that he was in town and A, he couldn't come into the studio and B, he couldn't have our delicious gourmet burgers after the show. So we'll have to get that all scheduled. <laughs> the secret is out, sir. The, the legend has spread that we have delicious gourmet burgers here. So everybody wants a piece of it now. We will get we'll get Tim on the print the next time we do that. I like it. Well, I know you got to head out. So really quickly before you go, uh, give us a quick tease. Give us a quick hint. What are you doing in New York? Anything cool that we can look forward to in FTSE Russell Options and Derivatives Land in the coming weeks, sir? Um, I'm out there. I'm out there pound, pounding the pavement, uh, bringing in more interest and in, in interest in, in the Russell suite of products on our on our partner exchange itself. Um, just look for continued volume, open interest growth. Uh, and and just global distribution of the products because our, our partner exchanges, our CME group in particular, is just doing a, a phenomenal job of that. And uh, 
I look forward to the next show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me again. And hopefully we'll have you in person next time, maybe with some delicious burgers. What do you think? Tim's got me hungry now. <laughs> he's got me thinking. You, you got me hungry. <laughs> he's got me thinking. He's talking that. He's talking about taco, trade a cash open, all these food-related things. He's got me hungry. Uh, well, I appreciate you making some time for us, Mr. Sean. We'll look forward to seeing you, hopefully, maybe in person next week. What do you say? I'll be there. I'll see you next week. I promise. All right. There he goes. Mr. Sean uh, holding down the fort. We haven't had him on in like a month. Happy we get some time with him. Man, I don't envy his travel schedule. He's in Munich one week. He's in New York the next. He's in some other far-flung corner of Asia the next week. So getting the man on the show, let alone in person, (laughs) is always challenging. But Russell 2000, getting kind of interesting. A bit of a quiet week on the options front out there. But probably not surprising given the fact that all that stuff was going on overseas. Interesting to see. To the the European response to what is an inherently U.S.-based domestic product. What is not is, of course, our old friend WTI. Bit of an interesting week. I told you what was going on with Brent. WTI kind of the other way. WTI off about two handles or about 3.5% this week. Still at that 56 level, uh, which is, you know, a, a level people have been watching, but not, again, threatening to break through 60 or anything like that. A vol, as you might expect, coming in. This has kind of been our story. We talked last week uh, with Mr. Rhodes about the surprising non-response of WTI to the crazy madness, I think, to create a term there that had unfolded there in Saudi Arabia. The Bulls have been waiting. We hear from you. The Bulls have been waiting for a case in WTI for so long. It seems like maybe they had one very briefly. And then the market decided, yeah, not so much. They crushed the skew. They crushed the vol. They crushed the underlying, and it came right back down. Again, the vol off about uh, two or so handles out here. Uh, Looks like a decent week. OI up about 3.6%. The biggest, most active contract this week was the, looks like it was the uh, the Nove contract out here doing almost, almost half of the... Paper about 49.5%. Let's just round up to a half out here. So no of getting the action. 21 days to go out there. So we can look a little bit skew out there. The big trade, actually the 60 calls, which is kind of interesting. I was just, just talking about that strike. Apparently that one's still active, doing the lion's share of its business. Yesterday about 7,300, about 4,000 today. Total about 16,000. Not huge size this week. I think a lot of people are still kind of reeling and making sense of what happened uh, last week, number two are the double puts. That's not surprising. It's kind of the at-the-money put strike now. 15,000 of those, a.k.a. the 55. I had people asking before, what, is, what do you mean by double? 55, listeners. Sometimes that old trader lingo slips in there. <laughs> 55 puts, 15,300 of those. Number three, the 65 calls, 13,000, pretty much even. Uh, the lion's share going up yesterday again, 6,800. Pretty quiet the rest of the week. And then rounding out our top five here, looks like we actually got to go all the way out to Deese. The Deese, 40 puts, doing about 10,000 of those. The lion's share again yesterday, 7,300. Most of that opening, about half of that opening. So opening on the 40 put strike in Deese. Interesting. I'll have to dig in a little more to see maybe if we could see it's a little, if it's a little bit of the old premium harvest or not. Meanwhile, let's talk some skew. A skew. Let's go out. Let's go back to Nova. That's where half of the paper went up. It's still got about 21 days to go. So we can. We can parse. I like a month. Well, give me more than two weeks, so I'm happy. Let's see here. The puts were fairly rich last week. They were about 1% rich at the money, so I guess comparatively rich compared to where they are right now. This week, they've come in markedly. They're 8.1% cheap to the at the money, so the put wing has come in quite a bit. The calls were were slightly bid, 2.1% rich this week. They are firmly bid, 13.1%. That is interesting. You know, we've been talking about that for a while that's a move we've been waiting to see. You know, let's go out a little bit because Nova only has 21 days. Let's go out to Deese. Let's go out almost two months. That's a little bit firmer contract. Let's see if we see a similar move out there. The puts were about 4% risk at the money this week. They're about 4.2. So the puts kind of staying unched in Deese. In, let's see, the calls in Deese, though, they were about almost 1% cheap at the money. This, this week, 6% rich. So that is interesting. That is a move people have been looking for, speculating on, will we see it? We thought we probably would see it last week, where we had a tremendous upside case for WTI, at least early in the week. And instead, we're seeing it this week, which is somewhat surprising and really fascinating. I want to sink my teeth more into that as well. Obviously, the big trade in Deese was the 40 puts, but the puts were kind of unched 
It was the call. Let's look really quickly to see what was lighting up the calls here in DC. And we got to get to our crypto conversation here as well. Uh, 9,000 of the 70 calls. So far, all the money calls. Pretty active throughout the week. The lion's share yesterday, 3,000, 2,700 today. And then about 6,000 of the 60 calls. Uh, all pretty active throughout the week there as well. So not a ton of paper, but clearly enough and clearly bidding up that call skew, which is kind of fascinating. The 70 strike by, I mean, if they were overriding all that, we wouldn't see the calls obviously getting as aggressively bid as they are. So interesting, surprising paper. Is this... Is this the moment the worm is turning in WTI? The underlying is certainly not saying that, but maybe maybe the skew reflecting a little bit of interesting change. All you've been writing in for weeks and months now saying, where is this change in the skew? We're seeing it right now. Is this, is this going to stay? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Meanwhile, you don't have to wait and see anymore. You guys have been asking us, what's up with these Bitcoin options at CME? What are they doing? Why are they launching them now? Why didn't they launch them on your show? <laughs> Well, let's put their feet to the fire right now. We haven't talked crypto in a long time, but let's do it as I toss to myself. All right, and next up, joining me on the Twifo program now, an old friend of the program, even though he hasn't been on in a little while. He is Tim McCourt, the global head of equity products and indeed oversees a little product category over there known as crypto at CME Group. Tim, welcome back to the Twifo program. Thanks, Mark. Good to be back. Excited to be here today, and thanks again for having me. Tim, I heard you've been a busy guy of late. Is that true, sir? Yeah, things are, things are picking up over here. You know, some exciting product announcements end of last week, uh, and it's been keeping us busy, and, and we're excited. So, yeah, things have been busy here at CMA. I don't know at all what you're referring to. Of course, listeners, <laughs> it's been a big time. We talked about it last week. I have to give you a bit of a hard time, Tim. Because I don't know if you know this, but we record Twifo on Thursday, not Friday. So uh, you missed the day of our show by a mere 24 hours or so. I'm sure that was just a, an oversight on your part, correct, sir? Yes, clear oversight, clear oversight. Um, you know, I, I, I blame corporate communication. That's, that's it. Who I, that's who I blame. Always but. pass the buck whenever possible, sir. That's a, that's a good strategy. <laughs> Let's get to right now. I can't wait any longer. Of course, I'm talking listeners about the, the big announcement from the past week, something that you guys have been bugging us about ever since the heady days of late 2017, when, of course, Bitcoin was racing to 20,000, CME and SIBO were racing each other out of the gate to list the Bitcoin futures, the natural question we received a lot, which, of course, I then turned over to you guys, Tim, was when are we going to see the options? We even ran a poll back there in January of 2018, so right kind of the kickoff of the phase of the futures. And we asked, we polled all of our audience, when do you think we're going to see the Bitcoin options? I was the comparative naysayer. I said Q2. I dared. I had the temerity to say Q2 of 2018. Everybody else in our audience was overwhelmingly leaning towards Q1. They gave me a hard time about it. Here we are, of course, approaching Q4 of 2019. And we finally have the announcement uh, and so, Tim, I know I've been pestering you for the better part of two years now on this. On behalf of our audience, I'm glad to see that. I know you acknowledge increasing client demand in your press release and everything else, because I know you, know you have to there. But let's be honest, between you and me, it's just you and me talking. You, you really did it just to get me off your back, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, if, there, if there was any slight in, you know, ambiguity as to whether or not we should definitely do it, it was the avoidance of more questions on Twifo that put it over the line, you know. You're like this Longo guy, he keeps bugging us. He won't shut up about the options. Let's let's just keep <laughs> him quiet for another week. Let's give him something. But yeah, this is a this is big news. This has been coming for a long time. I know I've been jokingly, but only half joking, really bugging you every time I talk to you, Tim. Do I not ask you about this at the end of it? No matter what we're talking about, don't I always bring it back to Bitcoin options at the end of the day? You do. We're gonna to have to come up with a new a new close to the program. We have to come up with another hard question <laughs> you have, to, uh, you have to ask me that I won't that I won't answer. You know, and uh, I think you know. All joking aside, though, I think what's great though is, is is Mark and you hit on it is the customer interest in Bitcoin options has been around since shortly after announcing the launch of the futures back in 2017, uh, and it's just really exciting to be able to bring this to market, to work with customers, to work with our clearing members. The engagement's been outstanding. The feedback has been great since we announced on last Friday. Uh, and people are excited, not only here at CME, but customers are excited. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to bringing this product to market. Uh, and it's not every so often in your, in, in your career that you're able to introduce a product 
uh, into such clearly articulated customer demand. So I think it's been a lot of fun for us and my team and for the exchange. And it's really exciting that in something as new as Bitcoin that we can blaze the trail with respect to introducing options on a regulated venue for market participants to manage their risk. It's great. It's exciting. Yeah, that has to be exciting for a guy like you because, you know, you're right. Usually you're, you're launching a product and you're, you're trying to build demand for it. You're trying to get the word out there. You're trying to get people interested in maybe some esoteric index, something like that. Here it is. It's almost completely the opposite. Demand has been hitting you in the face for the better part of two years. So that, that's actually got to be somewhat refreshing, I would think, Tim, for a guy in your position to be able to finally meet that demand. That's correct. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been great. and Our customers have been great in providing the feedback. Uh, you know, and we still have some work to do. That's why, you know, we're announcing, we announced that we're launching in Q1 of next year. We don't quite have the launch date yet, but, you know, after the announcement, we're getting uh, further inundated with uh, requests for information and people wanting to have conversations about contract specs. So we're also continuing some of that engagement with customers to make sure that when we, when we bring this contract to market, that it specifically meets all of their needs. Uh, and it, it, the engagement has continued to be high after the announcement, but people are psyched. You know, I think people are, you know, you give them a little, they always want more. We say Q1 2020, now everyone wants, wants, wants to know when in Q1, but we're working on it. And uh, in the coming weeks, we'll certainly refine that launch date as we finish up the rounds of these conversations with customers and some of our clearing members. That brings up the obvious question of why now? Why get it out there now? Was it just you think you hit the tipping point in the future? talking about around 7,000 ADV. Is that the number you've been waiting for? Was there some other metric that made you decide now is the time to announce this, even though, like you said, you still have another three to six months before we're probably going to see them in the wild? No, it's a great question. And there's no one specific indicator that we look to. But when we look at the robust success that the futures have had uh, over the summer and kind of coming into the fall months here in 2019, the continued growth of the Bitcoin futures at CME has been undeniable. You know, we had record trading uh, both for a month and a single day back in May, where, if you recall, the Bitcoin futures traded almost 34,000 futures equivalent, more than 160,000 Bitcoin equivalent, you know, just about $1.2, $1.3 billion of notional. That month, we traded almost 14,000 for the entire month. We had a record quarter for Q2, trading more than 10,000 for the month. Uh, and we've had record open interest, record large open interest holders. So all of these things are kind of coming together in a confluence where the ecosystem is really starting to come to a point where the participation continues to grow. And now we think it makes good sense that the futures can support the options market uh, and, and satisfy that demand from customers. I think it also is helpful when you look at some of the price action that we've seen in Bitcoin, even just the last few days, but even over the summer, you know, as the asset moves, it does lend itself more to people wanting option strategies to both manage their risk or hedge some of their positions in the spot market or the futures market. Uh, so it's just all these things together. We just have more data points and we have more certainty about the, the product that we're going to roll out into the market that it will not only meet the needs of our customers with respect to risk management, but it will also satisfy our desires with respect to rolling out this product in a controlled fashion with the right risk protections uh, on the regulated venue. Uh, and, and those are kind of, as those things came together, now is the perfect time where we've hit that critical mass in the futures market. That recent rally in Bitcoin sounds like it, it played a factor as well. Is it fair to say then maybe if we were still languishing around the, the 3,000 level like we were back in March, at the tail end of the, the pronounced crypto winter there, then maybe we wouldn't? be seeing crypto options right now because you don't think maybe the interest or the demand would be there? So I think that's a good question. I think it's hard to say for certain, but I think what we look at it is, uh, you know, as the distribution of prices of the asset widen out, it tends to lend itself more to people needing both upside and downside protection at various levels because no one always agrees where is it going from here. Uh, so typically those types of price movements and volatility uh, you know, options make more sense, and the inability to trade them presents more challenges, uh, as we've seen some of these upswings and downswings in Bitcoin, where if it was stagnating around a certain level, options obviously less important uh, because you're not actively managing the price movement as it traverses that price discovery up or down. Uh, so certainly as we caught some of this run back up to, you know, 10, 12, 13, you know, 13,000 in Bitcoin, it did 
showcased the fact that people thought they could even more precisely manage their risk if they had options and various strikes and tenors that they could, they, they could trade besides just trading the future. Well, I do have to say, Tim, we get their question on our crypto program quite a bit about where can I trade you know, the options, how can I trade them? And invariably, for most U.S. listeners, it involves having to VPN through some external, really non-U.S. regulated entity that, that violates their terms of service. So you could have your account shut down at any time. It, it is not at all a good customer experience in any way, shape, or form. So I am looking forward to sometime in Q1, Tim, being able to recommend people actually be able to go out and actually trade a listed lit, regulated, cleared option here in the U.S. They don't need to sneak in at midnight with a VPN into some Swedish server to trade it. So that at least will be, I think, a welcome and refreshing change for our audience, Tim. Oh, for, for certain. I think that's one of the benefits of seeming just like with our futures back in December of 2017. If customers are trading at CME, it's very easy for them to trade the Bitcoin future. And then in the same fashion, our Bitcoin options will plug and play with the existing connectivity they have through their broker or through their FCM, as long as they're permission to trade the product. It's just like trading every other product on Globex here at CMA. And you kind of mentioned the window is still kind of hazy for when they're coming, but we're getting asked all the time. So I'd be remiss if I didn't put it to you. Q1 is a pretty wide window. You think people can look forward to it? Maybe a bit of a New Year's present or is it going to be more like, you know, post Boca late March we're talking here? I don't know. I think the one lesson learned is I should certainly coordinate with your show calendar so you don't give me a hard time when we do it. Well, that, that's a given, uh, sir. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think, you know, there is no set time. Uh, we're still engaging with some of the clearing members as well as uh, the regulator. So once we finish some of these conversations, finalize the product spec, then we could, we could circle around the launch date. I think in terms of the cadence, the way we're looking at it from here is we will likely circulate um, final product specs uh, in the coming weeks. And then after that, once we kind of have the solidified reaction and, you know, more precise feedback from the marketplace that these are the correct specs, then we'll look to uh, harden that launch date. The idea being this way, if we're a little bit off in the design, we'll need some time to course correct. uh, And obviously that will then impact the, the launch date. So we don't want to kind of commit too early and have to change that date. But over the next few weeks, these things will be cemented and people will then ha- can circle the dates on their calendar and get ready to trade the options uh, in Q1. I like it. I like it. Now, you know, Tim, the audience is never happy. You give them one product, they want more. And we've been hearing for a while now that you guys at CME have been beefing up some of your other reference rates, like ETH, for example. So that, of course, leads to the conversation, but maybe we're going to see some more crypto futures coming in the near future. Any any hints you can give our audience about what else you guys have up your sleeve over there in the crypto space at CME, sir? Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin is certainly keeping us busy, with even with the futures, and then added options launched onto it. So we're going to be busy with that for the foreseeable future. But I think you're right. You know, what's, what's worth noting is back at the end of August, you know, late in the day on the 30th, Gemini joined both the constituent exchange universe that contribute their transactions to both the Bitcoin reference rate and the Bitcoin real-time index with our partner crypto facilities, as well as the Ether reference rate. So we're pleased that both pricing products uh, for Bitcoin and for Ether, you know, the CME CF reference rate and real-time indices, that they've continued to grow in terms of the robustness and the swath of the market that they represent both for Bitcoin dollar and Ether dollar spot trading. It's certainly an exciting development. We continue to work with crypto facilities, and, uh, you know, we're always looking at additional reference prices to bring to the market. So while there's no plans uh, on the horizon for futures on other, you know, other than Bitcoin, uh, we continue to work uh, the separate develop- product development track where we are looking and hoping to bring additional reference prices to the market uh, over the coming months as well. Uh, but right now, Bitcoin options is, is front and center and commanding all of our attention here at CME with respect to crypto. Well, some of the other product categories that you oversee over there have been knocking it out of the park with, shall we say, smaller contract sizes. Any thoughts about maybe applying that methodology to the crypto space? Well, obviously, the crypto future is getting a lot of volume, but it's also a pretty beefy contract. Any thoughts about maybe, let's say, going a mini, a one coin, anything along those lines? Well, that's a good question. You're obviously talking about my other, my other part of my day job here at Equity Index at CME where 
you know, we did back in May have one of the or the most successful product launch in Siemens history when we introduced the micro e-mini futures on the S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, and Russell 2000. Uh, and But what was unique about those indices is when we look at the equity index market, those e-mini contracts, if we take the S&P 500, for example, when that was introduced in the mid-90s, that was worth about $50,000 of contract notional. And with the kind of pervasive bull run that we've seen in the equity market over the last decade plus, that contract has grown to about $150,000. So it's tripled in value, which has just priced out some of the market participants, uh, it, you know, in the active individual trader, in the retail segment, as well as some of the other segments of our customers. Uh, when we look at something like Bitcoin, you know, we don't have plans to introduce a micro size or a mini size contract for Bitcoin because we still believe the five coin multiplier is the right size contract when we look at how it's been adopted and how it's being used both from a trading perspective as well as an access perspective for those firms that want to invest in Bitcoin or access the Bitcoin market. We do think five coin is the more appropriately sized contract, but like everything else, we're all ears with customer demand, right? So if enough customers come to us and say they really need that smaller contract, we'll continue to evaluate it. But right now, the feedback we have gotten is is the market and our participants are, are pretty satisfied with the five-coin multiplier and how that's been, been performing to date. Well, let's touch on that other product area you're overseeing you're lucky tim you got you got two hot ones under your purview over there so you definitely you definitely got a nice nice assignments over there in cme land of course i'm talking about a small a small market segment known as equities where indeed as you mentioned uh, those micro e-mini futures have been just just dominating the tape i know tim you and i talked when they first launched and i think everyone thought they would probably find an audience because there is clearly a demand in that equity space for smaller kind of bite-sized, more nuanced contracts. But I, I certainly didn't. I'm assuming you probably didn't as well. I don't think anyone expected these things to just light up the tape the way they have over the past few months. Uh, no, they certainly exceeded even my own wildest and loftiest expectations. I mean, it's been a huge, enormous success and a tremendous team effort here at CME to really pull this off. And just another example of when we work with not only our, our internal colleagues here at CME, but more importantly, our customers and the external stakeholders that we have in the marketplace with the various market participants and customers, when we all get together to solve that problem collectively, we can generate success like this we've, that we've seen with the micros. Launching that product into that clearly articulated demand is really what made it, made it successful early days. Yeah, now we did see some added or heightened volatility back around May 6th when we launched, and that certainly helped. But the staying power these contracts have demonstrated, you know, where they, they totaled a little over 310,000 contracts back on May 6th when they launched, but now we're running close to 500,000 contracts for the year with several days over a million total for these contracts. So it's been absolutely astounding to watch, uh, and it's been a lot of fun, and, uh, you know, it's it's been a real highlight of my time here. See, I've been here about six and a half years. And to be part of something like that, that was fun and, and historic and seeing the, the way the market and everyone rallied around it, it was really uh, a memorable experience and one that I'll cherish for a long time. Clearly, this is bite-sized, so it's suitable for retail, and a lot of retail are clearly flocking to it. But the, the volume, the numbers going up there, that's obviously exceeding more than just your 10-lot grandmother in Iowa, there's a lot more, obviously, institutions and large players are using these contracts as well. I'm curious, what are you hearing from the institutional side? Why are they adopting these products in such such high numbers? So when you think about it, the same way the active individual trader in the retail segment can benefit from the smaller or bite size size contract that you've mentioned, so can the buy side customers and some of the professional and institutional traders because that smaller contract gives you more precision. So if you're looking at the way you're managing some option delta or the way you may be alloc- – if you're a buy-side asset manager and you may be allocating positions across various funds, you now can do that in a fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 increment as opposed to leaving cash in the various managed or omnibus accounts until you had $150,000 to swap into a future. So it's really that increased precision – that the smaller size contract affords that is attractive to all the customer segments, whether they be retail, buy side, sell side, and even some of the proprietary trading firms and CTAs and things of that nature. The smaller contract just allows them to be more precise, 
and they can manage their risk better or scale up their trading strategies in a more manageable way, which is why I think we've seen some of this explosive volume growth that we've seen to date. It's being adopted by several aspects of the marketplace, not just for retail. Obviously, the micro minis are, are tearing it up on the volume charts, but it's been a tumultuous, volatile time in the equity markets, a lot going on. Uh, what else is lighting up your tape over there in equity land to CME these days, Tim? Well, yeah, the, I mean, the classic E-minis, as we now refer to them, continue to also be great. You know, we just came out of the September roll, uh, which was another another interesting time when you see the markets moving like this, the financing rates of the rolls tend to move. But, you know, everything continues to go well. You know, we have the Russell... I hear CME, it's been just about two years since we migrated that position back to CME and and brought that contract home, and that's continued to grow and do great things here at CME. Uh, You know, we look at things like our BTIC and our total return futures and dividend futures. It's really exciting that we are are seeing some of these products come off, uh, you know, in terms of their, sorry, in terms of the way they're trading in the marketplace and the way they're, they're kind of coming off some of these market bouts of volatility and just really scaling in response to customers' needs. I think what's also interesting is our favorite named product here at CME, Taco, right, which is traded cash open. Uh, you know, we have BTIC Plus and Taco Plus coming uh, to the exchange uh, on October, the weekend of October 6th for trade date October 7th. And what I'm really excited about that new product for, and I'm not sure people really have, have dug into the details yet, is this will allow people to trade the close of the index or the open of the index days in advance. So it's really the advent of T-plus trading in the futures market, which I'm excited about. I think it's a really unique innovation that we're delivering to the market here at CME, and that launches on October 7th, again, available Sunday night the 6th for trade dates the 7th. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun to watch as well. Uh, and the start of T-plus trading or forward trading in the equity markets for futures is going to be another great innovation for us all. Taco, you're making me hungry for lunch now, Tim. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I'm glad you brought up Russell as well because I had your friend, Mr. Sean Smith from FTSE Russell on the program with me earlier. And he asked me to quote unquote bug you about Russell. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up there because uh, he always likes to get, yeah. his, get his Russell plugs in there. But, you know, but we have been talking about the Russell suite on the show for a while now and kind of watching the volume. Obviously, we, we zero in on the options. That's kind of our bailiwick. And it has been interesting to watch because that volume certainly has been ticking up. Interesting pockets of volume as well out there where we're seeing, unlike, let's say, the E-mini S&P 500, which has a variety of different things going on, it does seem like there's a lot of interest in the Russell 2000 options for whatever reason. And pretty longer term, pretty far out of the money puts. There continues to be interest in action and roles out there, almost unique unto itself. It's, it's definitely interesting paper out there. And certainly, if you've been watching the Russell of late, it, it's an interesting index. It kind of moves to the beat of its own drum a little bit. So I'm sure that probably attracts maybe an interesting, maybe a little bit of a different institutional clientele, Tim, than your traditional, let's say, S&P E-mini out there. Oh, for sure. You know, and Russell is, is continuing to do great here at CME. And when we look at something like the options, I think what's, what's interesting to note is when we look back when we first got that contract uh, back in 2017, the options were doing maybe about 1,500 contracts a day. That's since grown. So I think we're for a full year this date. Uh, you know, year to date in 2019 so far, we're doing about 2,500 contracts a day for the full year is great. But what's interesting is when we've seen some of the recent bouts of volatility that really started in August and have continued here, uh, you know, here and there in September, we're seeing a few, you know, four or 5,000 lot days pretty consistently in Russell options, which is great to see. Uh, I think part of that, is, as Mark, as you pointed out, is that Russell 2000 has very unique characteristics in the index space. It's the small cap space. It's entirely ensconced in the U.S. market. Uh, so these are the, the companies that benefit from innovation and business cycle growth, but they also are somewhat immune to some of the more international aspects or some of the more macro geopolitical because a lot of their revenue is not necessarily coming from overseas. So things with respect to that are, are behave a little bit differently. They tend to do better with respect to U.S. Uh, corporate tax you know, chatter and changes and things like that. That's been a hot trade the last few years, as we know. So I think it's always interesting to watch the Russell, given its small cap in nature. It's the smaller companies that are listed here in the U.S., but they're exclusive. I don't want to say exclusively, but maybe primarily a lot of the revenue source is domestic. So it has a very different profile 
when you, than when you compare it to the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or even the Russell 1000. Uh, so I always like to keep my eye on the small caps. I think it's, uh, it's always an interesting barometer for the U.S. market. Well, Tim, we talked about the Bitcoin options. Obviously, that's the big elephant in the room. We got some prospective launch windows under our wings for those. We talked about the micro e-minis lighting up the tape. We even talked some more esoteric things like the deliciously named taco. And, of course, uh, I got Sean's jabs in there about Russell 2000. So we, we covered a pretty broad array of products. That said, if there's anything we left off the table, you're like, oh, wait, I forgot to mention that. Or maybe you want to leave our audience... A little bit of a hint, a little bit of tease, maybe ETH futures, hint, hint, whatever, whatever you got up your sleeve, sir. Now is the time. The floor is yours. Oh, uh, I think I think I'm all out of you know tidbits to share for today. Uh, I mean, we covered a lot. Nothing else really, um, you know, on the horizon. You know, don't, don't worry, we're not gonna we're not gonna break news necessarily tomorrow on you again, um, <laughs> like we did last week, the day after. So sorry again, we missed last week's show, but thank you. So I'm safe. I'm safe for a week or two at least. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I think my producers were more angry than I was. I'm like, what are they doing? We just got the show. <laughs> they have to book these things. So that to them, content is, is a great thing. Well, Tim, I'm glad you could join us. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of another epic journey through the world of futures options. On behalf of Tim and, of course, our buddy Sean there from FTSE Russell, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in those questions. I apologize we didn't get to them this week. We'll get to them next week, and we'll see you back here again tomorrow. 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern for Volatility Views. And we do it all back again on Monday for Option Block. And then we're right back here on Thursday for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X. Dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 